Welcome to Revive. We're so glad that you're here. What started as a really small church right around 25 years ago has obviously grown beyond any of our thoughts or dreams or imaginations. And we believe that because of God's spirit, the best days are yet to come. Right before the pandemic hit in fall of 2019, Hope celebrated our 25th birthday. And right around that same time, we felt led to dream new visions and dreams and ask God what was next. And so we felt like God has led us into 10 goals for 10 years between 2020 and 2030. And we believe that God has something for you as a part of this vision that God is leading us into as a church. The vision reminds us that our best days are yet to come. Go out and share this good news. Build bridges of harmony. We want to be unity agents. Serve new waves of revival sent to the church by the Holy Spirit. We want to be a spirit-filled church. Serve our neighbors in need as the hands and feet of Jesus. We want our cities to be positively changed and to be different 10 years from now than they are today because Lutheran Church of Hope is here. Not just city changers, but world changers because Jesus says go into the whole world. We want to be an intergenerational church. We want to make disciples to go from seeker to believer to follower to servant leader and around again. We want to be kingdom expanders. We want to be legacy makers. We want to love those who are broken, broke, tired, scared, sick, in prison, lost, or wandering. That's the heart of hope. All right, what's up, Revive? How you doing tonight? How you doing tonight, Revive? We are so glad that you're here. We believe it's no accident you're here. We've been praying for you. How about you say, before we get started with worship, with praise and worship, how about you tell three of your neighbors, I'm glad that you're here. I'm so glad that you guys are here tonight. All right, so for this next song, the first song of the worship set is called Holy Water. We've never done it here before at Revive, but I'm sure you've heard it before. It's by We The Kingdom. It's got a little country, a little folk vibe going on to it. So I know sometimes it is scary and it's hard to engage in worship when you don't know the song. But I'm encouraging you today just to have fun, just to dance. Let the song be sung over you. You don't have to sing, it's okay. We can have fun and to know that God is right here with us right now. And he enjoys seeing you worship, he enjoys hearing you praise. So we're gonna sing this song, all right? Come on. Sweet, sweet, huh? 
Tonight's Bible reading comes from Habakkuk 3, 17 through 18. Even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. Here ends the reading.
thank you so much for today and for bringing us here. Um, Lord, I just pray that today we would have fun, that today we would just rejoice in knowing that we have breath in our lungs and that you gave us that. Jesus, we're here for you. We love you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. transformed by the soul-satisfying love of Jesus and grow as leaders wherever God has placed you in life. If you're brand new, we have a welcome gift for you as our thanks for being a visitor. Feel free to stop by the welcome tables in the back on your way out or on your way in next time. You can also fill out the Let's Connect card. If you want to become a part of the Revive team and share your gifts like in music, hospitality, prayer, audio, visual, doing the Bible reading, and more, then fill out the Put Me In Coach card. Come worship with me on the worship team. If you're an introvert like me, come hang out in the back. And whatever is happening in your life, we want to know how we can specifically pray for you. Let us know by using one of the prayer request cards. All of these cards are available on the welcome tables, in our Instagram bio, or on the Revive page on the Hope website. Beyond this worship service, there are lots of other ways for you to connect with other people and to grow in your faith. You can find the details for all opportunities at Revive and Hope on our Instagram and Facebook, on the weekly announcements, the weekly email and text communications, and you can also re-watch and share messages from our YouTube and podcast on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, or you can live stream Revive while you travel on revive.watch. But honestly, just find us on Instagram. Our mission at Hope is to reach out to the world around us and share the everlasting love of Jesus Christ. As a church, our goal is to give away half of our income to mission partners and local nonprofits. If you want to give through Revive, head to lutheranchurchofhope.org and click the green My Offering button on the top of the page. Or you can also text WDM Revive and a dollar amount to 515-219-9093. Thank you so much for being here and being a part of what God is doing here at Hope and Revive. We've been praying for you, and we don't think it's any accident that you're here. Welcome to Revive tonight. Good evening, everyone. My name is Robert Dusenberry. And my name is Kelsey Woodruff, and I am the Revive Ministry Coordinator. We are so glad that you guys are all here worshiping with us tonight, whether it's your first time, your hundredth time, or you're watching with us on the live stream. We don't believe it's any accident that you're here, like we said in the video, and we've been praying for you. Oh, no segue into my section. Okay, I see how it goes. Sorry. <laughs> now Robert will speak. <laughs> All right, well, we have a bunch of activities this summer lined up here at Revive. Uh, one of them, which I am I'm biased, it's my favorite one so far, is summer hangouts with boating. Um, and so this summer, this guy named Robert, he happens to be standing up here, uh, has had the idea that going out on boats is a lot of fun. And so this summer, there's going to be several Saturdays where I'll get a sailboat out or two, or get the kayaks down, or maybe go for a bike ride. And if we get enough people, maybe we'll take a pontoon out. Um, so if you feel like you want to do that, uh, you don't have to attend all the times. It's just an offering out there for you. Uh, feel free to sign up, send me an email. I'll get you on the list. And you'll have information for this summer for potential Saturday morning shenanigans. So... Yeah, and to go along with that, we're also going to have some patio happy hour, continuous summer hangouts. <laughs> 
with these two lovely ladies, Sydney and Sarah. They're excited about it. I'm excited about it. You should be too. It's going to be a lot of fun. You can just scan this QR code and it's going to take you to a Facebook group that you can join. I've been keeping an eye on this group. They're accepting your request so fast, faster than I could ever accept it. Um, and my job here at Hope is social media. So they're on it. They're excited to have you there and joining them. Um, and you can just be in touch with that group to make sure that you're seeing the dates and the places and the times that they will be gathering. It's going to be a lot of fun. Another announcement that we have is that we are doing a serve project here at Revive. It is going to be the single serve laundry packets um, for one of our mission partners, Hope Ministries. Uh, what they do is we take these dryer sheets. Jamie had a hard time with this last week. Dryer sheets. I made sure I knew the word. Uh, and we put a, po a Tide Pod in the dryer sheet and then you kind of wrap it all up and you leave a little note on it. And it's this nice little single use laundry packet for someone who's homeless who is going to Hope Ministries and using their laundry services. So we are going to be gathering these supplies. On the table, on the wall, there is a QR code. You can scan that for a registry this is really handy. You can just like order it through Amazon and ship it right here to the church. You don't have to go to the store and then bring it back. You can do that if you want to, um, but hope, we're, hopeful, we're hoping that that makes it a little bit easier on you guys as well. So if you want to donate in that way, and then we will be putting those laundry packets together here at Revive as well. So we're really excited about that and to be serving in that way. So then some other events here in the summer, two of them involving food. Uh, the first one is a breakfast club. Uh, over a few select Sundays over the next couple of months, uh, a group of us here at Revive are going to be getting together for breakfast before the 9.30 service. Uh, so if you go to the 8 o'clock service, you can come join at 9. If you go to the 9.30 service, come join at 9. Um, and so that will be, I think it ends up being three Sundays over the summer months. And so that'll just give you an opportunity to connect with other people on a Sunday morning. So then the next event, uh, Father's Day is here in a week and a half. Yes. Go yes. get your dad a gift. I know. My older sister and younger sister ordered the Father's Day gift for me, so I'm set there. <laughs> I just have them tell me how much I owe them. So. Um, but Lutheran Church of Hope is celebrating Father's Day with a meat motors and music uh, event. So there's going to be meat smoking, all sorts of food. There's going to be music playing, and there's going to be a lot of cool cars and other pieces of machinery that have engines. So it'll be a ton of fun. So come join it with your father and have a good time here. Yeah, this is going to be super fun. We're excited about it, so come and bring your family for that event. Also, it's summer now, which means that it's VBS, y'all. We're so excited about it. Um, we are looking for volunteers to help corral all the kids at Hope Ranch. And so if you could uh, check out the volunteer opportunities on our website, there are a million and one ways to volunteer. If you love kids, there is ways to be hands-on right there with kids all day long or whatever works with your work schedule maybe. Um, if you don't love kids, there's also great ways to help behind the scenes. You can prepare snacks. You can prepare the crafts. You can be one-on-one -on -one with the child. You can be on the safety team. That's really important to us here at Hope. So there's just all these different ways to volunteer. Um, and we hope that, we'll, that you'll check that out on the website. It's really fun to grab a friend, volunteer for VBS, and just like have some joy in that. It's a lot of fun here at Hope. Um, and then another fun announcement that brings me a whole lot of joy is that we have a new logo. If you are new, we have a new logo that we have redone. And so we are going to also be having some new merch and it is going to be available in Cafe Hope. Um, the order is officially put in, everyone. So we're really excited about this. We'll let you know when it's officially in there. Um, but all of the proceeds, all of the like money Cafe Hope makes from anything you buy, from a coffee to a book to a shirt, all goes to our mission. And so we're just really excited about this, and we're really excited to be able to rep Revive in this fun way. And then, <laughs> sorry about that. Last but not least, uh, we have prayer partners available in the back after service here tonight. So whether you've done it before or done it 100 times, feel free to go back there and get some prayer over you. If you have requests, they will take those. And if not, uh, just let God take care of that for you. So however you felt led, um, prayer is available after the service. Yeah, it's really great. That's all that we have for announcements. Some of you guys have these cards on your seat. Feel free to take those home. Keep them on the fridge. Give them to a friend to join you at your events. If you didn't get one, let me know, and we'll make sure that we get you guys one. I know that there's some seats that are empty that have cards. So uh, we're really glad you're here. Welcome to Revive.
We're going to take oh, turns out, watching funny okay. videos. All right. And you have to keep your best Grinch face okay. yep. while trying not to laugh. My Grinch <gasps> resting face. Here oh, it comes. Good. You can go first, actually. So I'm actually okay. outside. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I can laugh. Okay. okay Benedict, go. you go first. Ready? <laughs> Watch that monitor. Let's mm -hmm. play the first video there. Yeah. All right, here we go. My okay. turn. All right, good. Let's play. Good luck. Good luck. You get what? Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> what? I, can... I don't understand what I just saw. <laughs> all right, here we go. English classical. My turn. Training. Here we go. <clears throat> yes. No training at all. No training <laughs> at all. For me. Straight up the streets. Go. go on, do it, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You had a much, much tougher challenge. That was so... That was straight out of the gate. I had no idea. Ready? No, I wasn't ready. I, I, he certainly wasn't ready. Oh, God. Wait, what? Can we, can we <laughs> see that again. one again, uh, Dave? Wait. <laughs> 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 so sorry. Whoever that is, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Age is not kind. Oh, God. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Jamie, and I'm the Revive Young Adult Minister here at Hope's West Moines Campus. And I'm wondering, when is the last time that you just got lost in a moment? Maybe because you were laughing really hard. Uh, I wanted to just start tonight with a little bit of levity. Maybe because you were laughing really hard. Maybe because you were doing a favorite hobby. You were uh, hanging out with some of your favorite people. You were enjoying a really beautiful sunset. You were on the water. You're on the lake. You're swimming. You're doing something that you really love to do. I'm wondering for you, when is the last time that you just got lost in a moment? You just lost track of time and you uh, probably didn't even realize that that was happening until after some time had passed and you like looked at your watch or whatever. Um, I'm gonna ask you in a moment to just turn to some neighbors and share about that so you can think about that in a moment. But I'm gonna share uh, some moments lately where I got lost in the moment. Uh, my family all just kind of converged here in Des Moines unexpectedly last weekend or a couple weekends ago and we found ourselves at Fong's Pizza on Court Avenue at like 11 p.m. My mother has never seen such a thing. And it was really enjoyable to watch her just take in that whole experience, step over a little vom on the sidewalk. Like we really just made sure that she had like a good Saturday night Court Avenue experience. But then we, we got to go to Fong's and have some pizza. Um, I have a goddaughter who's four and she looks like a Palomino uh, pony there with her like long blonde hair just hanging everywhere. Whenever I take her to the park, which is where we were here, uh, I just lose track of time. Um, I went, recently went to Adventureland this last weekend and just just like hung out on weird little kid rides. This one was super safe. It just had a rope over, <laughs> just a rope. <laughs> just, it was very secure. And, uh, and then last night, I had the pleasure of uh, seeing an old friend of mine. It was really a lot of fun. I have a canoe, or at least I had a canoe. If you follow me on Instagram, you probably saw several weekends ago, I was at home at my parents' house and said like, hey, Instagram world, I have a canoe. I'm looking to sell it if anybody is interested. And literally one of my oldest friends on the planet, like when, when my younger siblings were born, I went to her house. When her younger siblings were born, she came to my house. One of my oldest friends replied and she is like, oh my gosh, I would love your canoe. And so it took a while for us to arrange, but she came up to my parents' house last night and I got to see her for the first time in years, meet some of her kids that I hadn't met yet. We had a terrifying time getting this 17 foot canoe on her husband's truck. He didn't show up. It was just the two of us and her kids. Uh, we got the canoe up and on top of the truck and then we realized that the wrong end was at the wrong end. Uh, my dad had showed up by that point in time and so he's like, well, rather than taking the whole canoe off, why don't you just like stand in the truck bed and just rotate the whole thing? <laughs> 
uh, I thought this is how I die, uh, is how this happens. <laughs> but we did it very successfully because we are strong, independent women. Uh, so yeah, sold that canoe and it felt really good. Uh, and I realized after a while, I had no idea how much time had passed. It was rather chaotic. Uh, as soon as she drove off into the sunset with this canoe, my younger sister texted and she was like, hey, we're going to Hoo Hot. Do you want to come to Hoo Hot? And I was like, yes, I want to go to Hoo Hot. So we go to Hoo Hot, meet up with her, her boyfriend. My parents came. They had also never been to Hoo Hot before, so that was a riot and just a ton of fun. I know. Well, now they've, mom has now been to Fong's and Hoo Hot. Like she's living her best life. Yeah. Um, and, and I was with my family at Hoo Hot and looked at the clock and it was like 8.15. I'm up in Ames. I still need to come home. Just one of those nights where you lose track of time because everything is just lovely, like just glorious, such a fun evening. And so I'm wondering for you what those moments are like. So I'm going to invite you in a second to turn to your neighbor and maybe you share a moment recently where you just got lost in the moment. Maybe it's an old like core memory that has been unlocked for you recently. Or maybe you're like, I always freeze in moments like this and I can't think of a single memory I've ever had in my entire life. <laughs> uh, you can just share something that you like to do if you can remember that. Uh, so just take a moment, turn to your neighbor and share and then we'll uh, continue on. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. All right, all right, all right. All right, take another moment, finish up what you haven't finished sharing yet. Turn to your conversation partner and say, you sound fun. Okay, I'm curious. I'm curious if anybody would be willing to just raise their hand and share some themes. You don't have to share, we did this and then we did this or this. Just share with me some themes maybe that you said or that your conversation partner shared. Maybe uh, the memories involved food or people or sunsets or I'm just curious what themes we have in the room. Any brave person want to raise their hand and shout it out? Yes. Uh, hanging out with friends. Hanging out with friends. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Brennan. Family and food, good ones. Who else? Yes. Oceanside. Oceanside. A little sand under the toes. Excellent. Yes. Isaac's is the worship night. Isaac's is the worship night. Oh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, who else? <laughs> food. food. Do none of the rest of you have good memories? <laughs> Does anyone have anything other than family, friends, food, music? Sunsets. Sunsets. Video games. What? <laughs> camping. Camp okay, some camping in this row over here. Fishing. Okay, yes. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Okay, one more. One more. Yeah, Jeff. Bicycling. Okay, these are all such fun things. You guys are such fun people. We should hang out more. Okay, so here's the thing about what we all just did. I feel like the room is, the room is lighter and brighter. Tonight, we're talking about joy. And all of these things uh, that we just talked about, if you'll go to the next slide, is that these are avenues where we experience joy. Joy, this robust experience, oh, there's a $10 word that just came out of my mouth, uh, this robust experience of being present in the moment, of feeling connected to other people or to this thing that you're engaged in, maybe feeling connected to God uh, with worship or something like that. And so that's the thing that we're looking at tonight in this series that we're doing called When the Spirit Appears. 
Uh, we're taking a look at this over this summer when the Spirit appears, specifically when God's Spirit appears, because oftentimes around churches or around faith communities, we tend to, to focus on like the sexy ways that God appears. And maybe you're like, that is the weirdest sentence I've ever heard. <laughs> what I mean is the ways that God appears that everyone like wants to talk about, like something miraculous, like God healing somebody or uh, or, uh, or speaking in tongues or the uh, or somebody being healed, all of these different like kind of wild like signs and wonders sorts of ways that God shows up and kind of shows off in somebody's life. It can be really fun to, to say that's how God shows up and we want to uh, see those things happen in our faith and in our communities and in our lives and that's all great and wonderful and true. But the reality of faith and how God's spirit moves is that God's spirit doesn't just move that way. God's spirit does move that way, absolutely, but that is by far uh, not the exclusive way that God's spirit moves. Often the way that God moves is a lot more subtle. It can be a little bit more nuanced. It shows up in the day to day. And so often we just miss it. And so tonight as we talk about joy, um, that's one of the ways that God's spirit shows up. So we're gonna look at some research, we're gonna look at some definitions and then dive into some really fun things. So we're uh, first of all gonna look at the difference between joy and happiness. First of all, joy. Um, this is from a, a researcher named Brene Brown. Y'all know I love Brene Brown. This is her most recent book, The Atlas of the Heart, Mapping Meaningful Connection in the Language of Human Experience. And she's categorized emotions based on uh, the places I go when I feel scared, the places I go where I feel overwhelmed. So like places being like an atlas, if you will. The places I go when I feel excited, the places I go when I feel ashamed. So she talks about... Um, getting like specific and granular about emotions in this book. And so in Atlas of the Heart, Brene writes, joy is sudden, it's unexpected. It is short lasting and high intensity. It's characterized by, by a connection with other people or with God or nature or the universe. Joy expands our thinking and attention and it fills us with a sense of freedom and abandon. I want you to just kind of soak in a time where you have felt these sorts of things and what that felt like for you. Now, joy is different than happiness, and here's how Brene uh, characterizes happiness. Happiness is stable. It's longer lasting, and normally the result of effort. It's lower in intensity than joy, and it's more self-focused. With happiness, we feel a sense of being in control. <laughs> like, woohoo, my life is finally going my way. I can be happy. <laughs> Unlike joy, which is more internal, happiness seems to be more external and circumstantial. So you can really begin to see some of some major differences here between joy and between happiness, both really awesome um, emotions that we feel. And so one of the things I think is really fascinating is that joy is sudden, unexpected. It's characterized by connection. Happiness is a little bit more self-focused, a little bit lower in intensity, maybe more stable. I wish joy was more stable. Excuse me. Um, happiness is a little bit more circumstantial. Joy carries with it a sense of freedom and abandon. So when we look at joy and we look at happiness, we think about, well, how did not just people today think about these things, but how did people in the ancient world think about this? Has joy and happiness kind of been consistent throughout the human experience? The, uh, the ancient Greeks call joy this, as you'll see on the next slide. They say joy is the good mood of the soul. That sounds really fun. <laughs> the good mood of the soul. Uh, and this, this sense of being, this sense of, of long-lasting, of stable, of, 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 of a way not just of, of being in the world and moving through moments with people or fishing or worship or whatever, but this more long-lasting, holistic, like a good mood of the soul. So when I think about this like idea of good mood of the soul, I want more of this. I want more joy. I want more happiness. I want more good mood for my soul. I do have to tell you as a student, I am now on summer break and I am filled with joy and I am filled with happiness and my soul is in a really good mood. So I feel really great about it. But still there are a lot of things in my life and in the world that steal our joy. So I wanted to take a look at together 
As we're looking at when the spirit appears, how the spirit brings joy, but what are the things that get in the way of that? How do we not experience God's joy that is free and that is accessible for all of us, but sometimes feels so inaccessible or so far away or so distant? So we're gonna look at five different things that steal our joy before we look at ways that we move into uh, the joy that God has for us. So the first one is uh, comparison. Two, statements that I've kind of merged that exist separately but that fit really closely together is that comparison is the thief of joy. And then comparison either makes you vain or bitter. (laughs) That anytime we get caught up in the scroll on social media or seeing somebody in our classrooms or in our teams or in our workplaces that excels and we begin to, uh, excels in any area and maybe they don't know that they excel but to us they have something that we want or that we desire or that we long for. And we can so easily get into this uh, mode of thinking about how I am in comparison with this other person. And the thing about comparison is that it always steals joy because it either makes you vain or it makes you bitter because you feel better than or less than. Comparison is one of the number one ways uh, that that joy gets stolen from our lives. So one, I want you to be aware of that. No shocker there, but comparison. A second thing that steals our joy is chasing a feeling. That feeling of I feel happy, I feel fulfilled, I feel satisfied, I feel deeply connected, I feel all these things. Now, we don't live in a world that's perfect, right? Uh, We don't live in a world where we can constantly live in this place of feeling almost this sense of like euphoric connection with God, with ourselves, with other people, with our hobbies, with our interests with the people that we love. And so anytime that that we chase that feeling, we're going to come up empty. One of the most wise people that has ever lived, King Solomon, uh, who we uh, can read about in the Old Testament, was King David's son, wrote about this in the book of Ecclesiastes. He says, all of this is meaningless, a chasing after the wind which sounds really dark and very cynical. Um, Ecclesiastes is a part of the Old Testament called wisdom literature. Wisdom literature being uh, Proverbs, so there's a lot of wisdom in Proverbs. Also in the book of Ecclesiastes, that's where we see some cynicism come up. And then in the book of Job, uh, a book about deep grief and deep loss and sorrow. And you can say like, well, that's really weird to include in wisdom literature. Grief usually makes you wise uh, because it brings you some new experiences and a new depth of understanding of the human experience. Um, anyway, and so, but, but King Solomon says, all this is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. And the word that he uses here for the wind is like, it's not just like the wind that blows outside moves the leaves of the trees, but the word here also could refer to a vapor or smoke. Basically, something that you can't catch something that you can't like put in a bottle or a mason jar like a lightning bug, something that you can't uh, put in your phone and keep it for a while. All of this stuff Solomon says is meaningless. And we're going to look at more um, and why he says this in a little bit. But chasing a feeling is just like this. Chasing a feeling is like chasing after the wind. And that's something that can so often steal our joy. A third thing that steals our joy is numbing and self-medicating. Now we're getting to kind of the deep stuff here. <laughs> uh, now, Brene Brown, um, the author of this book that I, that I already told you about, says that you can't selectively numb, and she has done decades of emotions research, and she says you can't just selectively numb parts of your life. You can't numb pain over here without also numbing your capacity for joy or for sorrow or for fear or for excitement. You can't just pick the things that you numb. If you're going to numb, you numb all of it, which is really unfortunate, but also really good for us to be aware of. And so numbing pain also numbs our capacity for joy. And we all have tendencies where we numb, uh, either by you know screen time, scrolling, TV shows, video games, whatever. And then also self-medicating. Self-medicating being anything that you use to try to fix this emptiness that we feel in our lives. Um, Um, and medicating (laughs) with our own prescription rather than with a doctor's prescription, which is good and fine and healthy. Um, Ourselves medicating uh, and writing our own prescriptions is less healthy. And I want to park here for just a moment uh, because of some of the things here that really steal our joy um, are so pervasive in our culture right now. One of the things that really struck me when I was thinking about all of this is that Uh, numbing and self-medicating behavior isn't isolated to one gender over another. It's something that all human beings do. But one of the the things that's been really heavy on my heart lately is uh, how we have really 
uh, not done men well in our culture. We haven't raised men well with a capacity to emote or to feel safe, often emoting on workplaces, on teams, in families. We haven't given boys safe places to, to, to be who they are. You've heard me say this for a while if you've been around Revive. One of my good friends is a child therapist, and she uh, several years ago told me about how studies and research shows that adults, men and women, give girls, young girls, more prolonged eye contact, ask more emotions-based questions, and if a little girl falls, it's like, oh my gosh, honey, are you okay? Let me kiss it, mm, let me make it better, and then like fix her bow and like send her back off to play. Whereas with young boys, generally speaking, research shows we give little boys less prolonged eye contact, we, less, we ask less emotionally based questions, and if a little boy, generally speaking, falls and hurts his knee, it's like, ah, oh, rub some dirt on it, you're fine, get up and go play or whatever. And so she told me this right before vacation Bible school that summer, and I remember I was greeting at one of the doors, and all the little boys that would come by, I was like, hi, how are you today? <laughs> <laughs> I'm the creep the safety team needs to watch out for. <laughs> but we have really, as a culture, just corroded the masculine experience for feeling the full range of human emotions. And uh, particularly, I think about it um, in regards to men connecting with other men. We've, we've got this idea of masculinity that's so wrapped up in like being who I am and self-sufficient and not relying on anybody else, can't be vulnerable except with the safest people. And heaven forbid I as a man could be perceived as being too close to another man because that might mean something about me. It might mean that I'm gay as if there's something wrong with being gay. And so we, we have... Uh, or what, what does it mean about me as a straight man if, if a man that might not be straight be into me? Like, it's okay if he's gay, but I feel really weird about this. We have so corroded the male experience with this toxic idea of what it means to be masculine and what it be, means to be male that we have deeply done violence to the men in our communities. And so I think about it then when it comes to uh, the recent violence that we've seen. Pastor Mike talked about this this past weekend and showed this just real clear set of statistics um, from some recent research that of mass shooters, 98% are men. 67% have a criminal record. 65% have been diagnosed with a mental illness. 50% acquired guns legally. 50% acquired guns illegally. We have a problem with how we've been raising men in our culture, with how we've been leading men, how we've been teaching men, how we've been cultivating men, how we've been coaching men. And this isn't just a man's problem. Please don't hear me say that. This is men and women and all people. We, we've got some things that we need to grapple with or we're gonna continue to see issues like this. I also think about pornography. Man, I am not pulling any punches tonight. Making me sweaty, okay. I also think about pornography as well. Not that pornography is a guy's thing. It is not exclusive to any gender. But this, but this attempt at human connection, the thing that we were designed and created for that brings so much joy, you saw in the definition of joy, it's about connection with God, ourselves, and with other people. Pornography is a fake attempt at connecting that in the moment feels like a deep connection, but then immediately afterwards, there was no, that's, that's not a real person that's there. And it actually rewires the human brain in how we perceive connection with other people, how we can connect with other people. And so all of these things, when we take a look at what is stealing our joy, we have deep, deep problems in our culture and in our country right now with numbing and with self-medicating with all sorts of different things. And we see that in the violence that we enact towards one another. Now I'm not just talking about men and mass shooting. I'm talking about being mean girls. I'm talking about being snide at work. I'm talking about like, how many of you watched um, uh, Parks and Rec and they're always like being hard on Jerry or Gary or Terry, whatever his name actually was, because he had lots of different names that came out. We do violence to one another so often and so much of that is judgment to ourselves because of the pain that we carry. So we numb and we self-medicate. Okay, moving on. <laughs> um, number four, the fourth thing that steals our joy is hurry. So many of you were here several weeks, months ago when we talked about hurry. It was one of my favorite messages that we've done in a hot minute. Um, hurry 
steals our capacity to see one another, steals our capacity to connect because we're always rushing, we're busy, we've got a full schedule. John Mark Comer, if you read one, if, okay, if you read one book this year, it should be the Bible. <laughs> if you read two books this year, I would highly recommend The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And then the third book I would highly recommend is The Atlas of the Heart. You're like really set between the three of these. Uh, but in The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, John Mark Comer writes, love, joy, and peace are at the heart. At the heart of all Jesus is trying to grow in the soil of your life. And all three of those things are incompatible with hurry. Love, incompatible with hurry. Joy, incompatible with hurry. Peace. I, man, I tell you what, when I was on my way up to my parents the other night, I was almost there. And you'd be like, I live, I'm from Nevada. I live in Nevada. I don't live in Nevada. Uh, that would be a very long commute. Um, but uh, I've done it. That came across weird. Whatever, moving on. <laughs> I was trying to get home to my parents' house in Nevada, and there's train tracks on like all sides of this town, and I was almost there. And Lincoln Highway is closed right now. That's the one bypass of train tracks. And I had given myself extra time. I was very proud of myself because that's not something that I normally do um, or have capacity for is extra time. And I was almost home, and then like ding, ding, here came the railroad crossing things. And the I swear it was the slowest moving train. It was like chilled molasses. Molasses, just chilled honey, like it had just been in the fridge, just like slow, slow. And of course it was long as I've ever seen it, whatever. And I just did not have any peace in that moment. Like I think that I'm going to be late to meet my childhood friend. I'm going to be late to help them load this canoe, whatever. Peace is incompatible with hurry. And these three things, love, joy, and peace are at the core of what Jesus wants to grow in your life, all of you. He wants to grow this in your life. He wants to grow this in your parents' lives. He wants to grow this in your boss's lives. He wants to grow this in your significant other's life. He wants to grow this in the teams that you're on. Everywhere you are, Jesus wants to grow more love, joy, and peace, and it is incompatible with the hurried and overbooked and busy lives that we lead, which also so many of us self-medicate with busyness. So that cycles back uh, to that one. Carl Jung, uh, the famous psychologist, wrote, hurry is not of the devil, it is the devil. And Corey Ten Boom, we, uh, we talked about these in the, in the hurry messages. She says, if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. Oh, no. I, like, I felt that groan that you all just did in my soul because I feel it also. Okay, and then number five, the fifth thing that steals our joy is distraction and, it, and our lack of attention. Okay, I know that the next couple of slides are gonna be death by PowerPoint. I invite you all just take a deep breath and we're gonna move through them together. Yep, okay. So we're just gonna park here for a moment as well. The, uh, this book was a Pulitzer um, nominated book called The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains. It's written by um, a brilliant man named Nicholas Carr and he writes this. And this is a little bit dated. You can tell by, he calls the internet the net and it's a capital N in his writings, which I retained for posterity because it makes me giggle. Um, but okay, so Nicholas Carr writes, what the net seems to be doing is chipping away at my capacity for concentration and contemplation. Whether I'm online or not, my mind now expects to take Take in information the way that the net distributes it in a swiftly moving stream of particles. Once I was a scuba diver in the sea of words. Now I zip along the surface like a guy on a jet ski. I remember when I, because I am an elder millennial, and so I remember when I first got my, uh, my first smartphone. And I have to tell you, I remember literally after having my first smartphone for a while realizing I feel a little bit dumber because I know I can just Google it. I don't have to like let this information stick in my head. I'm letting go of how to hard boil an egg because I know I can Google it. I'm letting go of that movie that that person is in because I know I can Google it. Like I just kind of felt all of this information float out of my brain. So moving a little bit deeper into this, Sean Parker, I forgot to put his name on this next slide, but he was the first president of Facebook, played by Justin Timberlake in that movie, uh, Social Network, uh, and he now calls himself a conscientious objector to social media, which I think is fascinating. Again, death by PowerPoint, I thought about cutting out some of this, it's all so good, so I kept the whole thing. He says, begrudgingly, God only knows what it social media, is doing to our children's brains. The thought process that went into building these applications, Facebook being the first of them, 
It was all about how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible. And that means that we need to sort of give you a little dopamine hit every once in a while because someone liked or commented on a photo or a post or whatever. And that's going to get you to continue more, contribute more content, and that's going to get you more likes and comments. It is a social validation feedback loop, exactly the kind of thing that a hacker like myself would come up with because you're exploiting a vulnerability in human psychology. Fascinating. Now, the worst part of all of this, this feels like the lowest of the low places that we've been tonight. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about goldfish. <laughs> Uh, how many goldfish have you guys had? If you had like 10 in my house, I have stories I could tell you about goldfish. Goldfish are not like the smartest pets on the planet. I have a cat the color of a goldfish. Sometimes I feel like his brain is about the size of a goldfish's as well. Um, decades ago, the human attention span was 12 seconds. After the advent of the internet and digital media and social media, which kind of, generally speaking, they park around 2007, after 2007, the human attention span has gone down to eight seconds. What do you suppose the span, the attention span of a goldfish is? Nine seconds. The human attention span is now less than a goldfish's, scientifically. That's where we're at. So when I talk about joy, I feel like we've just really, I've spent this whole time like being like a downer and then a downer and then a downer. We're gonna, we're gonna come back up. But this is why this is so important. When we struggle with joy, when we struggle with wondering where is God in my life? How, why am I having such a hard time connecting with people? Why can I not just like find my people right away? Why am I having a hard time, whatever? Is because collectively, this is what we are up against. And yet the spirit of God is big enough and capable enough and powerful enough and um, desirous enough to still bring you joy through all of this. How do we do it? How do we, how do we say like, okay, God, I, I have all this noise in my life. I want more of you. How do we get there? We're going to take our cue from Solomon. Solomon was the son of King David and Bathsheba. He was anointed king after David and his estimated wealth is that he is in one of the top 10 most wealthy men in the history of the known universe. His estimated wealth is $2.2 trillion. It's more than Jeff Bezos by a lot, which actually like is kind of unfathomable to me. So Solomon, in his early years when he was anointed king, God came to him in a dream and said, Solomon, what do you want? I'll, I'll give it to you. I'll give you what you want. I'll give you riches. I'll give you fame. And Solomon asks God for wisdom. He says, I, I, I know that this is a big job. These are big shoes to fill. I want wisdom. And God, is said, and God says, that is really cool and delightful. And because you've asked for window, uh, wisdom, I'm going to give you everything else as well. And so Solomon then became one of the most wealthy people that has ever um, been known in the history of ever. Now, in wisdom literature, there's the book of Ecclesiastes. We don't talk about it very often. Uh, it is thought to be written by King Solomon at the end of his life. Solomon filled his life with basically anything that he wanted because he could. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. I don't even know how like managing that situation is possible. But I want you to take a look, again, this is the last death by PowerPoint thing. I want you to take a look at the end of Solomon's life or at least after kind of the peak of where he was, was aiming for, what he was grasping for. Uh, take a look at what he says about this. He says, I said to myself, come on, let's try pleasure. Let's Look for the good things in life. But I found that this too was meaningless. After much thought, I decided to cheer myself with wine. And while still seeking wisdom, I clutched at foolishness. I also tried to find meaning by building huge homes for myself and by planting beautiful vineyards, gardens, parks, fruit trees, water reservoirs. I collected more herds and flocks than those before me. I collected great sums of silver and gold. I hired wonderful singers. I had many beautiful concubines. I had everything a man could desire. So I became greater than all who had lived in Jerusalem before me, and my wisdom never failed me. Anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work, a reward for all my labors. But as I, as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was all meaningless, like chasing the wind, grasping a vapor, 
All of these things that we so often think are going to bring us joy. Solomon, one of the wisest humans that's ever lived, who had the resources to get whatever and whoever he wanted, this is his conclusion. John Mark Comer, uh, a pastor from Portland who um, writes this uh, ruthless elimination of her, he says, attention leads to awareness. What you give your attention to is the person that you become. Solomon discovered this pretty, pretty quickly, pretty easily. Where his attention was is what he became. Jesus says this. This isn't like extra biblical or like this guy said it or Solomon said it. Jesus also says this in the New Testament. He says, where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. That our, that our attention is valuable. That our attention and our focus, what we are undistracted about is what forms us and shapes us and influences the person that we become. So going back to Solomon, what is Solomon's conclusion about all of this? Solomon says, so I decided there is nothing better than to enjoy food and drink and find satisfaction in work. I think about the joy things that we all talked about at the beginning, this, the simple things. Then I realized that these pleasures are from the hand of God. For who can eat or enjoy anything apart from him, him being God? That God is the one who gives these gifts, that God is the one who gives us the capacity to enjoy them, to have these things bring joy into our life, that, that, is, that those are gifts of God's spirit. John Mark uh, Comer, I'm reading this book right now. I'm like really just eating it up, so I'm sharing all of it with you tonight. I'm quoting him a lot. Um, so this pastor then puts a, a faith-based spin on this. Worship and joy start with the capacity to turn our mind's attention towards the God who is always with us in the now. Worship and joy start with this capacity to cut out some distractions, to cut out hurry, to realize where we're self-medicating, to do all of the, to look through all of the things that steal our joy and say, how can I bring my attention to the God who is already here, who is already around me, who already loves me, who's already trying to cut through all the noise of my life and bring me joy? And it starts with worship. I have to tell you, for me, the moments in my life where I feel the most connected to God are, generally speaking, in this room. I love being here. I love worshiping. I love our worship team here at Revive, here at Hope. I'm biased, but I think they're unparalleled. Uh, these two pictures on the left are from the Revive worship night and the round that we did in April. And then the one on the right is from the Hope worship night. I missed both of these because I had COVID. And I was like, this is a direct attack from the enemy. <laughs> but I have to tell you, watching online was like still a mind-blowing experience. Being able to still worship at home in my living room. God's spirit is not limited to a building. God's spirit is not limited to a place just where we gather for worship. There, God's spirit is transcendent. God's spirit goes through the internet. I was just watching on my laptop and could still like, get the goosies and weep a little bit. Um, I thought this is beautiful. This is the, the verses from Habakkuk or Habakkuk. I took Hebrew and I still don't know how to say it. <laughs> that were read at the beginning of worship tonight. Though the cherry blossoms, cherry trees don't blossom and the strawberries don't ripen, though the apples are worm eaten and the wheat fields are stunted, though the sheep pens are sheepless and the cattle barns are empty, I'm singing joyful praise to God. I'm turning cartwheels of joy to my Savior God. Counting on God's rule to prevail, I take heart and gain strength. I run like a deer. I feel like I'm the king of the mountain. And then I loved the note that uh, this choir director put here at the bottom for congregational use for the full orchestra. That <laughs> uh, we could sing this sort of thing together. And I love this note from, from biblical wisdom from the prophets to say, regardless of circumstances, joy and worship are the thing that usher us more fully into God's presence, not because God is more present outside of worship, but because this is a place of connection. This is a thing that brings us together. This is our coffee date. This is us getting uh, together by Gray's Lake on a blanket to read a book. This is us going on a walk together. This is us going to a movie together. This is the way that we connect, or at least one of the many ways that we connect. One of my favorite ways to connect with God is through worship. And maybe you feel like worship is a great experience for you. Maybe you feel like you have a lot of questions about it or you look at other people doing weird things like showing their armpits to the room, you know, like, and you're like, I, that's, not my, that's not my scene. Uh, that's okay. You get to worship in all sorts of different ways. It's this connection point where God brings you alive. That joy is where 
I don't remember where I read this this week when I was digging into all this, but that joy is where God is making you the most you that you can be. That where you have been wired and designed and created to flourish, that's where you will feel joy and that's where God's spirit appears and moves in and through you. Jesus talks about this um, on uh, Palm Sunday as Jesus is, is triumphantly entering into the city of Jerusalem, not on a horse as a king of war would, but on a donkey as a king of peace would. The, all of these people are rushing to Jesus. They've got palm trees that they're waving around. They're laying their cloaks down so that Jesus um, and the donkey can like walk on this paved pathway. It was culturally something that they did. And the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders at the time look at Jesus and say, tell them to cut this out. Like, this is a distraction. This is wild. This is, uh, this, is, this is not something that is appropriate. This is an act, not of war, but of proclaiming a king that's not our king. And this is going to make you a, a political um, target. Jesus looks at these religious leaders and he says, if these people are quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. That we as human beings are so created to praise and to lift our voices with joy and to shout to God, Hosanna, which means God saves. It's not like praise you, it's it, save me, oh God. If we keep quiet, the rest of creation will do that job for us. That you were created to do this incredible thing, and that is to lift your voice. And the beautiful thing about this worship thing is that it's a loop. This worship and this joy thing is an incredible loop that where you notice you have joy and you pay attention to it and you begin to cultivate it and your focus is a little bit more there, then you experience a little bit deeper of that joy, a little bit more of the, God, of the presence of God that is there. Your radar picks up on it a little bit more. And then as you pay attention to it and the more that you notice it and you feed it and you cling to it, the more that it grows and the more that you experience it and then the more that you talk about it and the more that you experience it. And so we continue in this loop of joy that isn't bound by like the happiness sort of thing that's bound by circumstances, but it's bound by connection with God, with ourselves, with other people. We are designed for this. We're designed for joy. You are wired. Your spiritual and physical DNA is wired for joy. And the reason that we lose ourselves, going back to the way that we opened, the reason that we lose ourselves in these moments is because something bigger than ourselves is taking place. Brene writes in the Atlas of the Heart that joy is often the most, one of the most difficult experiences for human beings to articulate. It's hard to, harder to collect data about joy because it is so much bigger than the words that we even know how to use. She also talks about this. One of the biggest pieces of research that she found in her research is that our language limits our human experience because if you can't talk about it, if you don't have language to describe it, then it, it gets stuck. So our language can grow. And as our language grows for how we talk about our joy and talk about these times where we lose ourselves, we become more articulate and able to experience the joy that we even felt in these moments. And that's why we lose ourselves because something bigger than us is taking place. God's gift of presence and joy is for you. And maybe you're here and you're thinking, my joy, my life has looked very joyless lately. Maybe there's some joy here tonight for you. Maybe tonight is an opportunity for you to do a little audit of your life and consider where some things need to get cleared out so that you have a little bit more of a, of a highway than a dirt road to experiencing the joy of God that's accessible for you. Nehemiah in the Old Testament says to the people of Israel, the joy of the Lord is your strength that the joy of the Lord is this thing that buoys you regardless of circumstance. The joy of the Lord is this thing that is accessible for all of you. It's a gift. And so I wonder for you as we uh, begin to worship then tonight, if distractions steal joy and if in God's presence joy appears, what would happen if we prioritized cultivating time and rhythms to give attention and worship to God? What would happen to the joy accessibility in our lives? What would happen to the men around us if we cultivated more emotional language in our conversations? What would happen with the people in our workplaces if we prioritized our time and rhythms so that we worship, that we cultivate joy, and then, and then give and share a framework of that to the world around us? I think it could be quite transformative. And I feel like 
Revive is the place to do it. I feel like Revive is the community that gets to change Des Moines. I feel like Revive is the community and the place that that transforms us, that God uses. It's not about Revive, it's about the spirit that's here and what's happening in this worshiping community. I feel like I have a lot more I wanna say, but I'm gonna say it in prayer. So I invite you to pray with me. God, I thank you for your spirit. I thank you for the, the truth that when your spirit appears, it brings joy, it brings peace, it brings love, it brings light, it brings laughter. It also buoys us through times of difficulty and struggle where we don't know what way is up or what move is next. That your joy cuts through all the noise of that. God, I ask that you'd help us get really honest about where we're shutting joy down in our lives in an attempt to access joy. Help us get really clear about it. Help us turn to you. God, I pray for all the people in the room or who are hearing this message or this prayer who feel like their life is a valley of dry bones. God, would you revive us with your joy as people, as a church, as young adults, as a generation, as young adults in Des Moines or wherever it is that we are. God, I feel hungry for you. I feel hungry for your joy and for your peace. So I just ask for more of it for this room right now. God, I ask that your spirit would fill this place, that you'd fill us, that you would infuse us with such a a strong sense of your joy and your presence that we don't even know what to do with it. God, I ask that you would highlight and just point out to to us, people in our lives this week that could really use some love and some joy and some hope. Help us to not turn on a fire hose and just douse it, uh, but to be gentle and to come alongside and to have almost a supernatural ability to see where there is a lack of joy and what it is that you are calling us to do immediately in that moment to just bring more of you. God, help us to lean into you. Help us to not strive so much for joy as we do just lean into who you are, spend time with you, worship you, go on walks with you, notice you in the blooms and in the birds and in the sunshine and in the clouds and in the sunsets and in the water and in boating and in the eyes of one another. God, help us change the world. We love you and we lift all this up to you in Jesus' name. And all God's kids said, amen. Let's stand and worship.
talking about joy tonight and it's been a difficult couple weeks it's been a difficult couple years and so I don't know maybe you're experiencing the best joy of your life right now and that's awesome I pray to God that that's true but if you're in a dry season a hard season a season that's tough before we sing the bridge of now I can see your love is better than all the others that I've seen. I just want you to, I just want to create this space right now that we can just breathe. Breathe and know that the Father in heaven loves you, he loves me, he loves us. And that your dry season, there is rain coming. The Spirit of the Lord lives within you. He's always with you. He goes before you, beside you. And so if you're having a hard time experiencing joy, take this time as we pause and as the worship team continues to play this, this sound, this instrumental over you, to pray and ask God, Jesus, why am I having a hard time struggling with joy? Jesus, I need your joy right now. And so we're just gonna take this time to pray that you may receive the Spirit of the Lord and the fruits of the Spirit, the joy, love, and peace.
Thanks so much for being here tonight. I pray that you leave feeling infused with some joy or see some openings for joy in this week and where you can share joy. Uh, we got a couple quick reminders for you as you go. And that is we've got some ongoing summer hangouts, one with Robber and Boats at Raccoon River, which just sounds really exciting. I can't wait. And then also, so you can uh, scan this QR code that's here and also in the back, and that will just send an email to Robert. Like you have to hit the send button, but it's auto-populated with like, hi Robert, I'm interested. Uh, so then you can sign your name and uh, do that. So this gives you an email to Robert. And then the other one is a QR code that takes you to the Facebook group for the ongoing patty, ongoing patio happy hours, patty hours. Okay, patty airs, I don't know. Um, and then also, remember, we are gathering donations for the laundry single-use stuff with the dryer sheets and the Tide Pods. We're gathering those do donations up until next week, and then the last two weeks of Revive, we're going to put those together before and after Revive, so you can plan on that. And then the last announcement... Um, slash reminder is that we have prayer partners available. And if you feel led uh, to go ask a prayer partner to pray for an excess of joy for you or an increase of joy or to pray over the places in your life that feel dry, you can feel free to do that. Or if you're like, I just don't really know what I want them to pray for. Or if you've got whatever it is that you're on your mind, they're awesome prayer people and they would love to pray for you. And that will just be in this room right here with the glass windows in the back of the chapel. Thank you so much for being here. And we'll see you next time. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.